And thank you for inviting me to be here. I need to correct something. I was not the first Assistant Secretary oh. of State for Verification and Compliance. Um, a Dr. Owen J. Sheeks was actually my predecessor. He, he wasn't in the position very long because it took a long time for the State Department to finally agree to comply with the legislation that created the Bureau. Um, all of which they have now reversed. They're still within the law, but they've changed virtually everything that the Bureau was intended to do. Um, meaning, having a focus on verification and compliance. They've now turned it into the Arms Control Negotiating Bureau. And for a long time, it, it was clear to most observers that um, having the verifiers commingled with the negotiators was a bad idea. Because no negotiator on the face of the planet would enjoy having to make the, the tough decisions about verification a priority. So that said, um, I wanted to, I, I actually threw out what I had written before and, and started around midnight last night with something I, I wanted to talk about instead of my original thought. Um, and that is, we can learn from the past. So I'm going to start with a basic concept, which is simply put, the purpose of U.S. foreign policy is to induce other nations to behave in a manner consistent with U.S. interests and to deter them from acting in a manner inconsistent with those interests. America has an array of tools to try to achieve the purposes of foreign policy, economic, technological, moral, military, diplomatic, um, cultural. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just occurred to me that we should send Moscow Justin Bieber. <laughs> so that's a tool I hadn't thought of before, but it might be effective. We might have Putin crying uncle rather rapidly. One additional tool is the use of negotiated arms control agreements. In arms control, the United States trades away its freedom of action to secure national security based on the premise that the other party will comply. If the premise that America's treaty partners are complying is false, two options exist. Option one, ignore or tolerate the violation. Option two, respond to reverse the violation or deny the violator all benefits from his violation. Russian behavior in the international arena, including modernization of their forces, both legally and illegally, pose serious threats to America. But we've dealt with the mentality and the resulting behaviors of the current Russian regime before. And I believe that we can look at the actions taken back in the 1980s in response to Soviet noncompliance for lessons to identify the problem and develop a strategy and actions to either stop the unacceptable Russian actions or unilaterally deny them the benefits of their misbehavior. The documents on this history are in some cases obscure, and I'm trying to think about how to try to make some of them available. I, I was going through so many of them last night that I thought, oh, people, people need to have a set of these, because you might be geeks too. Um, in the summer of 1984, I started working as a graduate intern in the Verification and Intelligence Bureau at the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Under the direction of Dr. Manfred Eimer, I was asked to help with the analysis of Soviet noncompliance. In no small part, thanks to, or curse him forever, Dr. Mark Schneider, um, I started working in the Bureau as a full-time employee in 1985. I had asked Mark, you know, how do you get a job in Washington? And he says, well, how, how do you like working for Dr. Eimer? How do you like verification? I said, oh, I love it. I love this. Intel, policy, um, law, all coming together in one place. He said, well, why don't you ask Fred Eimer for a job? I go, oh, can you do that? He goes, yeah. Um, and I did. And I started a long and dark history <laughs> called my career. I wouldn't quite put it that way. Well, there have been moments. Yes. 
the Reagan administration learned through intelligence reports that a dark picture was emerging of Soviet noncompliance with its arms control obligations. And it became clear that a pattern of Moscow's noncompliance had to be figured into the U.S. approach to arms control. The executive branch issued its first report on Soviet noncompliance in January 1984, the first comprehensive historical analysis of Soviet noncompliance was prepared for the president by the General Advisory Committee to the President on Arms Control, or the GAC, as it's called. The GAC report was prepared at the code word level and issued as an unclassified report in October 1984. And many of us have spent way too much time trying to get it released, and it's one of those things that just never seems to happen. What emerged from all these reports was evidence that while the Soviet Union had not violated every arms control agreement to which they were a party, the ones they hadn't violated were those agreements that only banned things no nation would want to do anyway, such as the Antarctic Treaty or the Seabed Treaty. If, however, <clears throat> the Soviet Union could save a few rubles or gain strategic or tactical advantage, they violated their obligations. And it really was, there, some of their serious violations were, were simply things that they knew, they knew it was a violation. I'm, I'm thinking about the venting of nuclear debris, uh, which violated the limited test ban treaty. And the United States even said, look, we will help you with containment measures so that this debris doesn't go outside your national territory, um, which would have been a safety and health boon to the Soviet people and also to those outside the country. And they simply didn't want to bother. So <clears throat> while earlier administrations had responded to Soviet noncompliance by ignoring or legitimizing them, and that might require comment, um, there were several instances with the ABM Treaty where the United States would identify a violation and go talk to the Soviets. And the Soviets said, mm, maybe it's illegal, but we're not changing what we're doing. And so they would write a common understanding that legitimized it and said, OK, but this is the only time you get to do that. Um, but urged by Congress, and that's important, Congress was a strong player in all of the, the policy development during the Reagan administration. Um, so urged on by Congress, the Reagan administration refused to ignore or legitimize the activities. The Reagan administration issued additional compliance reports at least every year. And they also put out special publications. We had ACTA put out this uh, brochure or a white paper where we could try to say in an unclassified way as much as possible with photographs. The Pentagon put out the Soviet military power publications. Um, and so there was, a, there was a huge effort to get the information out. In addition, President Reagan raised noncompliance issues in every single bilateral meeting he had with his Russian counterpart. Secretary Schultz did the same thing. Every single bilat had a major component, not, not just a, oh, by the way, I, I meant to mention noncompliance. No, it was a part of the conversation, and it was a serious part of the conversation. So we, they had escalated as much as possible through diplomatic channels what could be done. On June 10th, 1985, President Reagan signed a National Security Decision Directive on building an interim framework of mutual restraint. In it, he acknowledged the problem of Soviet noncompliance and expressed the hope that noncompliance would be corrected. At the same time, he directed a number of studies to prepare the United States to take appropriate responses and called on the Soviet Union to join the U.S. in a policy of mutual restraint on strategic offensive arms. He outlined a U.S. force buildups that could have been undertaken at that time, but were not. So the message was, okay, we are getting pretty fed up with this. 
we may have to start looking at our own offensive forces and other changes to compensate for what you're doing in the strategic arena. We're not staying like this forever. Um, less than just under a year later, on May 27th, 1986, President Reagan announced that there was a new U.S. interim restraint policy responding to Soviet arms control violations. And I, I'm not sure if these are on the state website, but it's um, State Department Special Report Number 147. In that policy statement, he said, as part of the same decision last June to continue interim restraint, I also announced that we would take appropriate and proportionate responses when needed to protect our own security in the face of continuing Soviet noncompliance. It is my view that certain steps are now required by continued Soviet disregard for their obligations. Needless to say, the most essential near-term response to Soviet noncompliance remains the implementation of our full strategic modernization program to underwrite deterrence today and the continued pursuit of the Strategic Defense Initiative Research Program to see if it is possible to provide a safer and more stable basis for our future security and that of our allies. The SDI program represents our best hope for a future in which our security can rest upon the increasing contribution of defensive systems that threaten no one. It's all starting to sound a little familiar in terms of what, what one would expect an administration to do. But given all these activities, before the end of the Reagan administration, many, if not most, of the major Soviet violations had been reversed. And after many years of raising violations with Soviet representatives, they stopped work on the Krasnoyarsk radar, which was the, the single biggest violation. It was a, a finger in America's eye. And yet no one has ever brought me a little piece of the radar. <laughs> It has never been dismantled. Yeah, but Partially, people have yeah. been there. They could bring me a little crumble <laughs> brick. You know. Anyway, <clears throat> so what can we learn from all that? In addition to the fact that if anyone ever gets to the Krasnoyarsk radar in the Soviet Union, they might want to think about a gift <laughs> for me. All right, lessons learned. Lesson number one. This is what John Bolton uh, liked to call naming names. One of the things the administration did, in some cases more effectively than others, was to make uh, the public and our allies informed to the maximum degree about the nature and, and uh, of the threat posed by Soviet violations. We were frequently condemned for doing so, not only by the Soviets, but by the arms control apologensia. And it's, it's one of those things that if you didn't live through it, it's really hard to believe um, how people in the arms control advocacy community despised, hated the administration making public the Soviet violations. And it was never, they were never angry at the Soviet Union for violating. They were angry at us for reporting it. So at least in these days, you wouldn't have the same kind of problem. But one, of, one small caveat, if someone decided to take this approach, um, is that each and every time the United States charged the Soviet Union with a violation, they always came back and they tried to charge us with a violation that was as close as possible to what we had charged them with. So if one were to start doing this, you, you have to anticipate it. So part of what I'm saying is this administration should be naming names. And not only are they not doing that, they're showing not much inclination to do it in the future. So they have to be, they have to be pushed to do that. Lesson two. <coughs> Congress is a force multiplier. If the executive branch and Congress work together, or at least toward common goals, the odds of success in trying to get Russia to change their behavior is far greater than under any other circumstance. 
During the Reagan administration, the Soviet Union lobbied Congress hard against our verification compliance and enforcement efforts. It, it was pretty blatant. Um, importantly, their efforts didn't work. They had a few small successes, but nothing long. They invited some congressmen <clears throat> to go out to see this, the Krasnoyarsk radar, and when the congressman came back, they said, you know, they start, you know, you know congressmen, they decided to make their public announcements before they had talked to, to people who knew a little bit more. And they said, hell, violation, this thing isn't even operational. Well, it turns out that under the ABM treaty, one of the few things done well is that the minute they started pouring concrete for that radar, it was a violation. And so the congressman backed off and, and that went away, but that was the kind of thing that, that they were doing. In February, 1987, the Senate passed a resolution by a vote of 93 to 2, which, quote, declares that an important obstacle to the achievement of acceptable arms control agreements with the Soviet Union has been its violation of existing agreements and calls upon it to take steps to rectify its violation of such agreements and, in particular, to dismantle the newly constructed radar site at Krasnoyarsk, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, since it is in clear violation of the terms of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Then on May 6, 1987, the U.S. House of Representatives voted 416 to 0 in support of a resolution recognizing that by constructing the Krasnoyarsk radar, the Soviet Union violated its legal obligations under the ABM Treaty. More than a decade later, I was working on the SSCI, and one of my colleagues there, who had long worked on the Hill, and I were talking about noncompliance. And he mentioned that his primary experience with the topic had been when the senator he was working for uh, directed him to staff the development and passage of some stupid, worthless resolution saying that Krasnoyarsk radar was a violation. And I told him that in meetings of standing consultative commission and in the ABM treaty review in 1988, I waived those resolutions in front of the Soviet counterparts. And I said, look, America wants these violations to stop and we want them reversed. This is not just one guy at the White House. It is the American public represented by their representatives and we want it to stop. And I'm telling you, it had an effect. I mean, they got so nervous, and not as bad as when I did the whole lighter thing, but, um, but it was meaningful. And so here the folk, you know, someone who had worked hard to pass the resolution said, it's basically just a sense of the Senate resolution that has no effect. It had an effect. It was a useful tool. So lesson three, Con Congress has to exert direct and indirect pressure on the executive branch and on other nations. Without the support of the White House, Congress can still have a huge impact in the effort to bring violators back into compliance or to respond to deny violators the benefits of their cheating. A three-prong approach is required. First, direct pressure to sway the executive branch into action. Second, action to generate other pressures on the executive branch. And third, supporting and funding military programs that deny the violator the benefits of their violations. I know that, that those who've worked in this town for a long time have seen many, many letters from groups of congressmen or senators to the president. I really believe that these have an effect. Um, when I was at the State Department, I know that if there was a letter, especially a letter with the right number of signatures on it um, to the Secretary of State, the Secretary had to sit up and take notice didn't mean that each, you know, one letter changed the course of human history, but it was, it was a tool that had some effect. Um, 
calling executive branch political appointees to appear before Congress to address these problems. And I know that it, it takes a lot of time. It's hard to get you know, a hearing scheduled on a topic like that when you're in the budget season. So sometimes you can do staff briefings, but hauling their asses up here is a good thing to do. And every single political appointee made commitments in their confirmation process that they would respond when called. Call them, haul them up here. That means that their staffs are gonna spend a week or two drafting points that won't make Congress angry, and those will be cleared through the entire bureaucracy. By doing that, by focusing the questions, you are indeed changing the terms of the debate. You've got to do it consistently, and you know, there was a there was a gentleman that worked in the Senate named Dave Sullivan, and he used to torture me. <laughs> Look how happy this makes Mark Schneider. <laughs> he he used to torture me. I with had to questions. answer his questions too. <laughs> I mean, he would send a hundred questions, and they may only be on five topics. Yes but he would word them different ways so he could try to catch you because he figured they'd be farmed out. Well, let me tell you, he had our attention. You know, 15 or 30 of us in the bureaucracy that are working one issue were focused on doing nothing but getting his questions answered. It works. You may make enemies, but if you're a conservative Republican up here, Nobody in the bureaucracy is going to like you anyway, so go ahead. Um, I think that um, there, there are opportunities to defund White House priorities in non-related areas. Um, things like State Department employees really like to go do negotiations in nice places. Geneva, The Hague, I mean, they're Vienna, they like it. Well, see if you can defund something so that they're not getting to go, they're not getting to stay quite as long, you know, targeted little torture devices. That gets their attention. Um, and one of, the, one of the most important things is to make sure that the executive branch knows, and this will take a little bit more time, that they have to know that the probability of gaining Senate advice and consent to ratification of any new agreements is not gonna happen while these other things are going on. The, the problem with the Obama administration is that um, they've decided to take the, the White House approach with issuing executive orders as opposed to, you know, working with Congress on the laws. And they're trying to, they want to do that, and they've told the Russians they want to do that on arms control arrangements. And among other things, that means that, that staffers are going to have to pay a lot more attention to um, things like experts' meetings. Um, and they're not putting out very detailed statements of what it is they've been up to. Uh, now and then they'll, they'll give a speech and go ahead and put it on the state website, and those are really useful. So <clears throat> the other thing is the legislation that created my old bureau um, has two sections, one that talks about an annual compliance report and the other one that talks about verifiability assessments. Um, it's USC section 2593A and 2577. And the focus has been on um, the compliance reports, which are, are frankly so bad that I would have been embarrassed to put out the kind of junk they're putting out. Um, but the mandate for that report calls for an awful lot of other material that's never included in them. I never included them, because I didn't want to. But they could be forced to. Nobody ever called me on it. 
Um, things like, what is your overall approach? You know, what, what are you proposing to other countries? And in terms of verifiability, the right members and committees can task them with doing a verifiability assessment on proposals the United States has made to other countries or that they have made to us. So there may be more tools in there. And like questions, for the record, um, demanding those re you know, reports under existing law can be very effective. I mean, I think that adding new reports to the legislation, I, I think that's wearisome, but I think that better advantage can be taken of uh, the existing legislation. The whole time I was uh, Assistant Secretary for Verification and Compliance, which was from 2002 to 2009, I never had to write a verifiability assessment. Now, that was in part because some of my friends up here, I would go, please don't make me do that. You know, I'd rather break my fingernails. But they can be forced to do that and forced to address some of these big issues, like how are you going to verify tactical weapons you know, agreements? Mark mentioned earlier that you know, the idea of trying to, to reduce tactical nuclear weapons. My big fear is that Russia will say, oh, yes, no preconditions. We will enter into those negotiations with you. And from what we've seen with, with New START and everything else, I don't see that coming out in our favor. So indirect actions. These are things that are aimed at the executive branch. But the fulcrum is public attention, getting other nations to put pressure on the White House and putting pressure on the violators. Um, I guess my successor in my bureau didn't raise, didn't tell the NATO allies about the Russian violation of the INF Treaty until it had been well known for at least three years. Um, that's not a good way to do it, especially if you want them to become your allies in trying to put pressure. Um, resolutions and floor statements by members, press interviews, constituent communication, funding adjustments targeting the violator and other nations um, can help lend support. Congress can meet with representatives of the violating nation, either with the ambassador in Washington or during CODELs. And Congress can write to parliamentary members of the violating nation or other nations. In other words, taking naming names up to a whole new level. And then finally, President Reagan acknowledged the importance of missile defenses as an appropriate and proportionate response to violations of offensive force limitations. And funding uh, US missile defense efforts, real ones, not just, you know, Build-a-bear activities in some places are are really important. Getting back to real missile defenses that really shoot down real missiles, regardless of who lobs them at us. Those of you who've heard me just, I just think it's remarkable that we've ended up with this idea that it's okay to try to shoot down a, an Iranian or a North Korean ballistic missile, but. We've made commitments to, to Russia and China that our missile defenses aren't intended to, won't be designed for shooting down their missiles, as if it's OK to get nuked by them. Well, it's not OK to get nuked by anybody. So you know, things like that can get turned around. So at the beginning of my remarks, I noted that if the premise that America's treaty partners are complying is false. Two options exist. Option one, ignore or tolerate the violation. Option two, respond to reverse the violation or deny the violator all benefits from his violation. Option one, don't do anything, is far easier. The costs of taking option one are never in the short term. 
They're in the long term. They're in the credibility of America, the credibility of an arms control process, the credibility of deterrence. We say the line is here, don't cross it. If you draw a line in the sand with an arms control agreement and they step over it and you tell them to stop and they step over it, you tell them to stop and they step over it, there is no line in the sand. You've fundamentally undermined deterrence. And that could have an effect when you say, don't deploy that weapon system. Don't sell that weapon system to Iran. So option one is easier. The costs are not now. The costs are in the long term. Option two is difficult, and it's costly. And the costs are in the near term. But, and the benefits of option two are in the long term, not the near term. That means that any effort to try to do this is going to be fundamentally really hard. And it takes a commitment to national security, to deterrence, um, and it's difficult to ask members to do these things. They've got an awful lot on their plate. When I was working for Senator Kyle, I always thought C-SPAN should follow that man for a week. You know, I couldn't follow him for a week. I couldn't keep up with him going down the hallway, but that's another problem. Here I am in my little heels. So um, anyway, I, I think that the the administration's acknowledgement of the Russian violations of the INF Treaty are a significant, uh, is a significant event because they've hidden it for a long time. They are apparently doing nothing about it. They hid it for a long time, not only from Congress, but from our allies. And Aside from a couple of meetings that Rose Gottmuller has had, I have seen no effort to try to bring them back into compliance. None. So my conclusion is, as in so many areas of, of national and foreign policy right now, um, it's up to people outside the White House community. It's up to people on the Hill to try to take the action they can take and make a big difference. And there are a lot of things that you can do. And unlike with the Reagan administration, who was doing all this for the first time ever, that's not going to be the case for people that are trying to fight it now. And so with that, I will close.